Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We're going to go ahead and, and get started. Um, so my name is Ginger Spencer. I'm a deputy city manager with the city of Phoenix. And it is my privilege uh, to introduce a woman who needs no introduction, our vice mayor, Yasmeen Ansari, for Council District 7. And with that, I'll turn it over to the councilman. Thank you, Ginger. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm Phoenix Vice Mayor Yasmin Ansari and also the councilwoman representing this district, District 7. Um, this is a very important opportunity. Um, as you know, the city goes through a redistricting process once a decade. So um, we are in that process now and looking at making sure that we are continuing to serve every city of Phoenix resident as equitably as possible. Uh, something that I think is important to know is that uh, District 7 has actually grown in size significantly and is the most populous district, if I'm correct. And therefore, um, we will likely be, we are the ones who will have to lose some areas uh, as opposed to gain some areas because we've grown so much. Currently, District 7 includes uh, parts of downtown Phoenix, Levine, Estrella, Maryville, and South Phoenix. Um, and it's been an honor for me to represent those areas and really tonight we're just looking for your feedback and the staff will go through the process of what this will all look like and um, really just appreciate you being here on a Tuesday evening. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor. So everyone, thank you for attending tonight's redistricting meeting. Um, I get to introduce the rest of the team who will be presenting to you this um, evening. And so at the other table, all the way to the left, I guess that would be your right, is our city clerk, Denise Archibald. And then sitting next to Denise is Sam Mather, who's part of our consultant team. And then Prithi Mather, who makes up the other part of our consulting team. Uh, in the audience on the front row, we also have uh, Chris Meyer, who is our former city attorney, as well as former city clerk as well. <laughs> and, and Chris has participated in all four of the city's redistricting processes over the years. And then also uh, in the back of the room, we have our um, interpreter with us, Mr. Mario Barajas. And so if anyone needs interpretation, he is here this evening. Uh, and then also just want to thank all of the other staff who are here with us tonight from our communications office as well. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Denise to walk us through the presentation. All right. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Uh, as Ginger mentioned, I'm Denise Archibald, the Phoenix City Clerk. Thank you for being here at the redistricting community meeting for District 7. This, uh, the process for this redistricting will be the same process that we used in the last uh, three other processes in 1990, in 2000, and 2010. Part of that process includes uh, obtaining a professional and impartial process, which means that we always hire a consultant with the expertise in redistricting. And in this case, our consultants, as Ginger mentioned, are Sam and Preeti. Sam and Preeti are with ArcBridge Consulting and Training, and they are out of the Washington, D.C. area. And they were selected through a procurement process and approved by the city council to help us through this redistricting process, particularly with the data and mapping. The community input will be obtained by two rounds of community meetings, and so we are in the first round community meeting process right now. This particular round, this first round of community meetings, is uh, to let you know basically you know, how the process works and gather input regarding communities of interest. And, uh, and that's really important for us to be able to understand you know, more about the community, which you are the experts at. And, um, and then also be able to provide any other type of input that you uh, would like related to these plans. And once the round one uh, committee meetings are over, then the consultant will, take, uh, will continue taking uh, some of your input by we will be releasing a create your own map tool online. And so you'll be able to create your own maps and submit those as well for consideration. And the consultant will be evaluating each of those. And from that and the input provided by the community, 
then the consultants will go ahead and create a couple of, a few maps and alternatives, and then we'll come back out to the community in round two so that you can uh, know what those maps and plans are, and then you'll have more opportunity for, to provide input about those maps and, um, and what you believe about that. And then after that, we get the round two redistricting community feedback. We will basically have the consultant uh, do final plans that will be presented to the council in the fall. And then the council will uh, uh, approve you know, a redistricting plan. And then that will become effective in January of 2024. And it'll be just in time for the mayor and council, odd number council district election for November of 2024. So please note, we do have a redistricting website. It is phoenixredistricting.com, where you can currently submit comments uh, now. And then soon after round one community meetings, after June 20, starting June 29th, you'll be able to do a create your own map and submit that as well. And uh, we have a lot of materials out, uh, outside at the table that have that website and also our email and phone number where you can continue providing input. And we're requesting that all of the input come in by August 1st. And so with that, I will turn it over to Preeti to do the presentation. Good evening. Uh, I am Preeti Mathur, and I'm with Outbridge Consulting. And uh, we have been doing redistricting for a while. For we've been there like Chris, you know. I used to work at the Department of Justice, and I used to help the attorneys. I used to help the attorneys uh, review the plans which were submitted by various uh, counties and cities. So we've had uh, plenty of experience working with redistricting and we are happy to be here uh, working for the city of uh, Phoenix. Uh, in the presentation today, I'm going to show you uh, how the data sets that are used for redistricting and I will show you the data and then show you uh, how we need to do redistricting because our current districts are not going, uh, do not comply with the redistricting guidelines. So here we are, and uh, these are your current council districts, and we have a map which you're very familiar with. And then on the top, we have the 2010 uh, redistricting data, which you see over here. And when the districts were drawn, uh, the population of the city of Phoenix was 1.4 million. And now, if you can see, the population has now grown to 1.6 million. So having said that, back then our target was having 180,704 people, approximately, you know, in each district. So that was our target, but now our target has grown to 201,000 and 17. So, uh, and currently the maximum deviation, which is 4.74, and now it's 14.45. What that means is that we do have to redistrict, and then I'll talk about the redistricting guidelines as well. So here, this is a comparison, once again, of the 2010 and 2020 data. For redistricting, the Bureau of Census releases this data called Public Law 94-171 data set, and that is what we are supposed to use for redistricting. So what in 2010, we, I already showed you the 2010, 2020, 2010, and the bottom line is that we have gained 162,507 people over the decade. So here, now we wanted to see where was the growth. So in this chart, you can see that each district has grown. You can see the numbers here, that this was in 2010, and this is in 2020, and that each district has grown. And we have D7 here, and you can see D7 has the maximum growth, 32,500. And 88 people. So, and if you look at the map, what we have done is we have color coded it. The darker the color, the more growth. And of course, D7 stands out. <clears throat> so, here now we are looking at the statistics and seeing how is each district doing as compared to our target. Our target is 201,017 people in each district. 
And you can see the D7 has the most, about 17,000 people more than the target. So what, when we start looking at balancing the districts, we'll, we know right off the bat that D7 would have to give, have, will have to lose population so that it could be balanced. And the red and green color scheme that you're seeing here, the green districts are the ones that need, like you can see D3 needs 12,000 people, D4, 10,000, 10,000. So in order to balance the districts, we have to make some changes. And we know that D7 would have to give up some areas. So once again, here, the same information uh, you're seeing. You can see up top that this is our target. And the districts which are below, the, below this line, you know that they have to gain. And you can see that D7 is right here and it is over, and it has 17,000 people more. So now moving on to the next slide. So this is just to set the stage, you know, that we do have to redistrict. We have to change the boundaries so that each district has almost as equal population as possible. So now with this, I just want to talk about the redistricting guidelines. So when we begin the process of doing, which we have already started, and this is the first step where we are here to meet with you, show you the data, and kind of get your feedback. So I'll talk about the legal requirements, and some of them are federal requirements, and some of them are your local city charter requirements. So the first one, which is a federal requirement, is equal population. And uh, you can see here that the maximum deviation should be less than 5% and 1% for individual districts. And of course, you know, we have to make sure that the minorities are fairly represented. And other guidelines are that uh, we would like to, we are here to get your feedback on what you think are your communities of interest. Then we must look at uh, contiguity and compactness. We cannot cherry pick areas that I want this area, this area in a district. They have to be contiguous and compact. And then we want to preserve the core of the current districts. We cannot just draw the districts that totally look different than what they are. And then continuity of representation, which means that when we draw the new districts, we want to make sure that the current incumbents are still in their own districts. And uh, preservation of political subdivisions. Here for the city of Phoenix, we are using the county precincts. And as uh, there is a map outside which has the city of Phoenix and which has all the precincts labels there. So that is what we are, those are the guidelines that we should be using. So we looked at the 2010 data and we wanted to see the racial ethnic composition of the districts. So there are two maps. On the left hand side, you're, you're seeing the racial ethnic composition of each district. And on the right hand side, we are showing you the same information, but at the block level, at the city block level. So here the red is Hispanic majority districts, and the yellow is the non-Hispanic white majority districts. And uh, here, when we look at the block level, we can see some uh, greens, which are non-Hispanic Asian, and some uh, blue, which is non-Hispanic black. So this was the uh, situation in 2010. So we wanted to see, with the new data, what does it look like? So here, this is 2020 data, and you can see it's pretty much the districts are, we have four Hispanic majority districts, and we have four non-Hispanic white majority districts. And you can see here, in the, when we look at the final at the block level at more detail, we can see some greens, we can see some blues, so we can see some others, but primarily it's Hispanic population and non-Hispanic white population. So now what we wanted to do was look at D7 data, 
And I showed you before that the gain, uh, D7 has had a gain of 32,588 people. And uh, so here we are looking at the district and uh, we are showing you that in yellow that this is the Hispanic majority district and you're seeing the 2020 total population and you're seeing the voting age population. So you can see how the district has changed and how the population, uh, and here you can see the racial and ethnic categories. We have Hispanic, and the N8 stands for non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, and so these are the categories that we, are use, but that we use for redistricting. And with this, what I wanted to do was uh, get your feedback, your questions and comments, so that we can start, when we start drawing these alternate plans, we can take your feedback and put it into the new district. Thank you, Prithi. Um, so, yes, thank you. So we've got a great turnout this evening, and we do have individuals who've submitted cards. Uh, we'll call their names. Uh, and then after we go through these individuals, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or come up to the mic, and we'll get to you as well. All right. So our first person is Patrick McDaniel. Good evening, uh, Vice Mayor Ansari, uh, city staff, and uh, community members. My name is Patrick McDaniel. Um, I live in the Garfield neighborhood. I'm also the Director of Advocacy for Phoenix Community Alliance. We're in our 40th year of advocating for downtown residents, downtown businesses, and for a greater, uh, for greater um, downtown Phoenix as well. Um, just a couple quick comments. I realize that this is just the very beginning of a process, of a long process, and a process that, that's defined by data. But I think it's important to keep in mind that um, that hopefully um, that the number of districts that, that touch upon the, the downtown Phoenix, that touch upon uh, the core of downtown Phoenix should not be decreased from three. I think it's important with a with large number of districts as the three, that brings greater representation to overall city of Phoenix. And also that our num the numbers are roughly, are roughly even if you look at the, the graphic that we saw earlier, it does not appear that there's any need to radically alter, radically change um, the composition of districts. And finally, like I said, I know that these numbers are predicated upon census data, but also bearing in mind that from, two th from 2020 till 2023, there has been a considerable amount of the development in downtown Phoenix, new residents in downtown Phoenix, and that those topics should be um, taken into consideration as well. So thank you very much for your time, and I'm, I look forward to um, seeing the maps that will be produced and commenting upon those in September. Thank you. Daniel. Okay, next we have Ryan Boyd. Evening, uh, for the record, Ryan Boyd at 1069 West Taylor Street. Um, a lot of comments here, just mostly that I would prefer, frankly, to keep compactness to the district. It is interesting that when I go to work, I go up into District 4 and then back into District 7 when I often go down to the uh, friends down south, uh, down the uh, South Central Light Rail's future corridor. I'm going down through District 8, back into District 7, and then back out to District 8. So really, if we can kind of try to basically create more of that compactness, it has been interesting uh, for me, and that's probably my highest priority at this point is making those lines a little bit more easy to describe, especially because, uh, frankly, the way that, oh, as an added level of detail, how we do our city council district elections, it's been very interesting to try to message uh, which side is voting at which time. So it's been a, a difficult kind of challenge on that side of house. Um, when it comes to the uh, rest of the kind of district, I, I, I'm a downtowner, so I obviously kind of prefer having a little bit more uh, compactness and kind of strength here within the core. Uh, I think there's a lot of community of interest shared along the light rail corridor in particular that's been kind of caught up in the past. And to the last kind of point here, it is also the area that's slated for the most growth it has a lot of the permits and the other kind of items, so we probably are going to see more growth coming in, uh, and you'll probably be seeing a similar kind of thing with whatever district you put out of this kind of area being, again, probably overpopulated in 2033. So thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Boy. Next we have Rebecca Perea.
Thank you. Um, my, my comments are a bit similar and a bit different from the last two. I'm a resident of District 7 in Levine, also a high growth area. And some of the, a lot of the community in Levine, if you notice, it actually splits two districts and it has a lot of still county islands plus additional large growth. I think um, myself and a lot of my um, community peers would like to see Levine compacted instead of split across two or more districts. Thank you, Ms. Pereira. Okay, and next we have Michaela Larkin Andrews. Uh, thank you, I had a question um, related to slide, oh sorry, related to slide number eight. And um, it was basically um, that I was trying to understand um, what those requirements, were they rooted in the city's charter? Were they re rooted in the Voter Requirements Act? And in particular, it was the conti continuity of representation and the preservation of the core of current uh, districts, those, those two factors. And I think my comment was that I live in District 7, but I live in South Phoenix, probably over a good 15 to 20 minutes away from my friend Rebecca, who just spoke. And I think that um, I'm worried that choosing the preservation of core of current districts might kind of lead to the prep, um, kind of the continuation of inequities and kind of not keeping like South Phoenix as consolidated as one might want, you know, kind of for growing a community. So that was my comment, but my question was related to just understanding the background on those two factors. So Michaela, thank you for that question. I'll take the first stab and then our Councilman, okay, Vice Mayor, excuse me. <laughs> uh, and then also have our consultants answer as well, and, and possibly even um, Chris Meyer if he'd like to jump in. So these redistricting requirements and guidelines, the first two, Equal Population and Voting Rights Act, those are legally required. And then the other guidelines that you see under there, those are just guiding principles. They are not in priority order, and so they're all listed there. Um, Part of this process, though, is for us to get feedback from the community on what you'd like to see. And so what we're hearing from individuals tonight, you want compactness, right? You don't want to have to go drive along the same street and go from district to district back to the same district again. Um, and so really, though, um, part of the preservation of the core current districts as well, though, I believe or was it the continuity of representation? We don't want to draw new maps to where the incumbent candidate, right, is now uh, not in their district anymore. And so that's really what we were trying to get at there. Uh, but these are guiding principles and they're not in priority order. And really that's where we want to hear from you, our residents. And just to clarify, that's more around the candidates or the incumbent's residents, right? Not that is correct, the, the sitting. Um, the folks who are currently in office. That is correct. Uh, preservation of core of current districts is once again a guideline. Guideline. We do not want to draw districts, you know, which are like totally different. So we want to preserve, you know, that the new districts are going to be somewhat similar to what you're currently used to. And once again, this is a guideline and we are here to he listen to you and uh, get your feedback and see how we can implement that. And if Chris, you want to add anything? Sure, I'll just, I'll add that the first two are legal. The first one from the Constitution and the Charter of the City of Phoenix. The second one is the Voting Rights Act and the requirements for equal population. So those are the ones that we have to comply with. As they said, the others are guidelines. In some cases, they're gonna conflict. And so you have to kind of balance those as you put the group, the districts together. Those five are traditionally common criteria used throughout the country in redistricting. All five of those have been recognized by the US Supreme Court as guidelines to follow when you're drawing redistricting plans and that will be applied when a court evaluates, if that comes to that, if a court evaluates those plans. Those are the same, basically, the priorities that we have used in 1990 and in 2000 and in 2010. So it's the same ones that we relied on and they are traditional um, requirements for redistricting. Thank you to the team for the responses. Are there any other questions or comments from anyone? Yes, if you don't mind. Familiar face? 
Hi, how are you today? Uh, Mark Davis, I live in District 7, uh, just on the other side of Central. Um, you know, thanks for organizing this and getting this started. Um, I know this is not probably in your, your necessarily initial scope of work, but the question I wanted to go to was kind of asking the question a little bit in terms of how big should each of these districts be really going forward? And it's under the premise and the concept of, you know, as, as our population grows, you know, is there an opportunity to use this as a catalyst to tell the story of um, uh, districts of 200,000 people in respectively, maybe doesn't get the, the representation that a, a municipality can offer to its community. And so I asked the question, you know, from the perspective of possibly in 1990, um, oh, go back to 1980, 80, 90, uh, 2000, 2010, you know, what has the population looked like in each of these respective districts? And, and maybe this is an opportunity for, for, for council and, and other folks to kind of start to tell the story of, of an opportunity to look at um, adding council seats. So that's kind of my comment. I know it's a little off topic, I apologize, but just wanted to put that out there a little bit. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Davis, actually those are great comments. Thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that you'll see on the website uh, at Phoenix Redistricting, at Phoenix, um, excuse me, phoenixredistricting.com, I was gonna give you our email address instead, but phoenixredistricting.com is you will find information about each of the precincts. And so on the map that we had out front for you, you'll see the various precincts that currently make up Council District 7, as well as other districts. And then ultimately what you'll see here is for um, the ideal population for each Council District is now 201,000 plus people. And so really that is the goal when you talk about how big, uh, that's the number that we're trying to hit. And so as you redraw your map or the lines, um, take in consideration the precinct size um, that you're drawing the boundaries for. And would you like to add to that? Yeah. Uh, right now, and uh, Chris can add to this and you all can add to it, the city charter has uh, eight districts. So if we want more districts, which would be ideal, that would mean that the charter would have to be changed to add more districts. And I believe, just, just to add to that, I believe, and I think it's a, I think it's a great comment, um, and there's no question, I mean, cities of comparable size to Phoenix um, have far greater numbers of council members. The city of Los Angeles has like 50, 12, I don't know how many it is. Chicago has 50 council members, that's one example. Um, they also each have massive staff sizes. We each have about four full-time staff members to take care of 200,000 residents. So um, it's definitely a huge, huge challenge. Um, it is something that would have to go to the voters to approve actually adding council districts. But I um, haven't given enough thought to say for or against, but I think it's a super valid point, Mark, that you bring up. And that has been brought up in, um, from some of our council members as well. And as the vice mayor stated, if that's something we're going to do, looking at adding more districts from the current eight that we have plus the mayor, then that would require a vote um, by our Phoenix residents, Phoenix voters. And so that's not a part of this process today, but could be considered as well. And so we actually have our consultants. We've retained them that once we finish this process, if that is the desire, of mayor and council, we could start looking at that as well. So, great question, thank you. Um, also, I received another card from Jessica Bueno. Hello, thank you everybody. Um, Jessica Bueno, Vice President, Phoenix Elementary School District, but uh, my question was already answered because it was about when are we gonna have the conversation about um, adding more council districts. I think it's very important for neighborhoods and our constituents to really have proper representation and resources. So I appreciate the answer of changing um, the city charter. And so I think it's something that, thank you for explaining that and it's something that we'll continue to advocate for. And I just wanna point out, I think we have a really great system with our village planning um, villages. And I think that could model and be the representation of our um, council districts. So 
thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and thank you for hosting this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Bueno. All right, any other comments or questions? Okay, well, thank you again for coming out this evening. I will uh, turn it back over to the vice mayor to close us out. Thank you so much. Not too much to add. I think these were all great points. I, um, one uh, interesting difference I noticed between two of the comments or just something that I've thought about throughout this process is um, whether or not it's more beneficial to have multiple council members representing an area versus the question of one dedicated council member per area. I think that I have not made up my mind what I think is better, um, but I think there's pros and cons to each, but I think it's an interesting question to think about as we move forward. Um, because I do think one kind of um, contradiction you'll see in, the, in some of those guidelines is ensuring continuity of some sort of current districts also means kind of continuing that split, which can be, you know, personally, I will just say from my experience, I have very much enjoyed representing the five areas of my district, but it also does often feel like representing five very different areas with very different needs, very different constituencies. Um, but I also think sometimes it can be valuable to have a few council members pushing for something for one area as well. So it's a, it's a tough question, but please give it some further thought and I, I will be very interested to see honestly what more residents think about that. Um, so appreciate you all coming out tonight. Thank you so much for uh, the team for providing the presentation and, and for staff for hosting and hope you all have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>